Father God, I pray you be with Mike, God. Speak through him. God, change hearts and change lives today through the power of your spirit. These things I pray and ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Now, uh, appreciate that cat call there. Um, I am uh, Mike Wilder. The kids, parents, you know me as Mr. Mike, and, uh, but I'm the children's pastor here at Woodland, and uh, appreciate that. You don't have to clap for that. It's like, yeah, we'll clap for that because no one wants to work with kids besides you. But anyway, um, hey, today is going to be a, a lot different, not a little different. It's going to be a lot different today. Um, and uh, we're going to have some fun today, and I believe wholeheartedly that Christians, those who believe in Jesus, are too serious at times. And we get a bad rep being too serious. And the thing about it is, I think we need to be more and have more fun. And, uh, you know, God created fun. So why not, you know, we're supposed to be like him in every aspect of our life. So why not have fun? And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to have some fun. And I coined a phrase to describe the type of fun we're going to have. And that is, edutaining you, edutaining you. It's a cross between education, educating, and entertaining. Put it together and we get edutaining. And if you're a teacher in here, or if you know a teacher, you can tell them that word. I'm fine. You can steal that. I'm fine with that. Now, in in fact, when I was a junior in college, um, before I got called to pursue ministry full-time, I was uh, going for my teaching degree, my bachelor's degree in teaching, and I was sitting in a class in the professor said, what's your philosophy for education? And uh, I said, oh, it's to be an edutainer. And they're like, "Uh, no, it's either you you just educate. You don't entertain, you educate. And I was like, okay, I'm out of here. And so uh, anyway, but hey, so that's what we're going to do today. And so hopefully you enjoy it. But as a children's pastor, I have certain responsibilities. And the responsibility I have is to provide a fun and safe environment for the kids. Now, uh, the, the fun part's easy. That's what, if you walk past the gym, that's why we have what we have in there. We have fun, because I want kids to have fun at church. I don't want it to be boring, okay? That's easy, you know? I want to have the kids have fun. Safe part is interesting, because according to this psychologist, Abraham Maslow, he has this hierarchy of needs, and safety, our need for safety is number two. It's very high up there, and we have to feel safe before we can start learning anything. And so once we have these safety uh, addressed, then I believe the kids can openly learn about faith. So when we have kids having fun and feeling safe, that means we can engage them in faith. And when these three things intersect, it creates something memorable and something that sticks for a lifetime. Okay. There's another part of responsibility I have as a children's pastor, and that is to be relevant. Now, relevant is really easy. It's just basically getting to know your audience, your age group you work with. And I got a story for this. Me and my uh, brother from another mother, Mr. Josh, okay, Josh Martin, if you know who that is, uh, we worked together. We went just a couple of weeks ago, we went to Bashaw Elementary School to do an FCAP party. And this was really fun for us. We love doing it. It's our second year doing it. And we had the fifth graders come to this party. And these fifth graders, seriously, I was like, are you sure you're fifth grade? You look like a sixth grader, seriously. And so at this party, we started talking to these fifth graders and we realized something. They're about to be sixth graders, but we are so irrelevant when it comes to students, sixth graders. So I'm very thankful that we have people here at our church, Mr. Sammy and Mr. Aaron, that are blessed to, and skilled to work with teenagers because I'm just irrelevant when it comes to that, which is, makes sense because when it comes to relevancy with kids, I love what they watch, what they do, and how they play. In fact, I, I go home and I end up sitting down and watching Disney Channel. Just not, and I say it's for work purposes, but it, you know, it's really not. And in fact, I go home and sit down and, and get out Flappy Birds and play it on my iPad because it's for work purposes. And so I love all this stuff. And the very thing I love the most is their movies, kids' movies. In fact, when I go, when I go to the movie theater, I end up, me and my wife, we end up going to see a kid movie instead of an adult one which is kind of, I can't even remember when I went and saw an adult movie, but that's okay. And I have my favorite movies and you probably have yours too. And that's why anytime I speak, kids or adults, I like to play a game. In fact, that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to play a game and see how well or how relevant you are at movies. And the game we're going to play is called Movie Quiz. And it's a real easy game. It's just, you have to shout out answers to me. And the game is this. I'm going to say three descriptive words of movies, and you have to use those three descriptive words and guess what the movie is. Pretty simple. You got that? Okay, great. Okay. I'll give you an example. Here's an example. 
Uh, before we start, an example of this is uh, uh, yellow brick road, red, ruby red slippers, and Wicked Witch. What would it be? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Wizard of Oz. Okay, cool. All right, cool. All right, so we've been, we got 10 of these. You're like, oh, no, just, it's fun. Remember, we're going to have some fun today. All right, here we go. The first one, Nazis, snakes, and whips. Yeah, Indiana, why is the only front of the room playing? Is it because I need to go out there? Uh, Indiana Jones, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter which one. I think there's eight of them now with the same guy, which I'm like, you're so old, stop. But anyway, he's, yeah, great movies, Indiana Jones, okay. Number two, swamp, fairy tale creatures, and the donkey. Shrek, was it the donkey they gave? Okay, yeah, Shrek, very good, awesome. Great movie, all, all three, eight and a half or whatever. This is a hard one. I think it's hard, at least for me it is. Saturday, Students in detention. Breakfast Club. Breakfast Club, yeah, yeah. Hey, old check. I wasn't even born when that movie first came out. <laughs> old check for you. <laughs> Off crowd. Okay, moving on. <laughs> I'm going to go home and cry now. No. Okay, here we go. Ship, treasure, and rum. Yeah, Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah, I said rum in church. Yeah, Pirates of the Caribbean. Okay. Keep going. Revolt, freedom, and a kilt. Braveheart. I heard over there. Good job. Good Braveheart. Okay. Runner, ping pong, and Jen A. Forrest Gump. Yeah, Jen A. Okay. A couple more. This one's a little tricky. It's a trick one. An angel, a banker, and Christmas Eve. Yeah, it's a wonderful life. Someone said last night, Scrooge. I was like, oh, I could be, except those are like spirits, but yeah, angel, yeah, okay. All right, three more. Africa, lions, and a warthog. Yeah, Lion King, Hakuna Matata. Okay, here we go. Crime, Joker, and a bat. Yeah, Batman. Batman, you gotta talk like this, it's fun. And I I learned yesterday, in fact, that Ben Affleck, yeah, he's coming back to be Batman again. So that's exciting. I hope he, hope he talks like this the whole time because I just love those type of movies. Okay, last one. This is easy, last one. Girls, a bad guy, and minions. Despicable me. Yeah, Despicable Me. You guys did a great job. Awesome job. Yeah, so you guys are pretty relevant when it comes to movies. Great job. Now, these are some great movies. And uh, the thing about it is my favorite movies are actually Disney movies. Shocker for a children's pastor to say his favorite movies are Disney movies, right? Well, there's a reason why, and that's because of the virtues there inside those movies. A virtue is a word that we could live out in our everyday life. Now, think about it. You're, you're, maybe your favorite Disney movies, maybe like um, Beauty and the Beast, right? That movie has this virtue of this, treat others the way you want to be treated. Gaston the Beast has that in there. Uh, the Lion King, yeah, yeah, Mufasa. That has the virtue of um, own up to responsibility. Yeah, he had to come back, own up to responsibility. Okay, this is a good one, this is a good one. Aladdin told us the virtue of we need to be ourselves, to be yourself, yeah? That is a virtue inside that movie. Now, here's the cool thing. I thought this was pretty awesome. In January, I went to the Children's Pastors Conference. And there they had this speaker named Matthew Lu. Now, he's a Christian who is an animator for Disney Pixar. He's a Christian animator for Disney Pixar. He worked on films like Up, Toy Story, Cars, you name it. He's worked on it for these people. Now, he, when he spoke at the conference, he said this. He said that it's all about the power of a story. He said that the reason Pixar is so successful is because of the powerful stories they tell. Then he goes on to say the reason they are powerful is because of the virtues within them. Okay, they have virtues. He first he describes this process like this. He first, they sit around a table and brainstorm and they, do, they throw out a virtue. So they first start with the virtue. And then once they fine tune and get that virtue they want in the movies, they then go and build the characters and storyline and plot around that virtue. It's pretty, pretty impressive. And then what's, what's very impressive to me is that this Christian guy, Matthew, the animator, he, every time he tells the virtues and gives suggestions, he says his inspiration comes from the gospel, comes from the Bible itself. And so all these movies, Pixar movies that you're watching, he says he got his inspiration for these virtues from the Bible. And I think he's correct in this. I really do. I really think he's right. And the reason why I think he's right is because I've done some research. 
And today, I'm going to share with you guys that research I gathered. I'm going to look at three virtues, three Disney movies, and I'm going to correlate that to what scripture, what the gospel has to say about it. Now, what is the gospel? Well, the gospel is the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each gospel tells the story of Jesus in their own unique way. So let's begin. The first virtue I'm going to dive into is the virtue of friendship. This is the definition of friendship. Spending, friendship is spending time with someone you trust and enjoy. Now, the enjoy part is really easy. It just basically means you like to hang out with the guy. You enjoy them. You go places. You have a fun time together. You hang out. Easy stuff. The trust part is a little tricky. In order to know if you have a, a true friend here, you have to answer these three questions. Do you have a friend that you could trust with your secrets? If you do, then you have a, a true friendship. Do you have a friend that has your back no matter what, through thick and thin? Are you there for each other? If you do, then you have a true friendship. Now, this is very important. This is a big one. Do you have a friend who accepts you for who you are, what you do, and even what you look like? That right there alone to me speaks volumes because we all have little quirks a little personality things, even, even though maybe the job we have or the way we look that are different than each other. And so if you have a true friend that accepts you for who you are and all those other things, then you have a measure of a true friend. Now there's a Disney movie that has this type of friendship in it. This Disney movie has two characters, unlikely characters being friends. And the movie I'm talking about is Disney Pixar's Cars 1 and Cars 2. In the movie, we have Lightning McQueen, a race car, a beautiful, shiny race car. He's running for the Piston Cup. Now, what happens is he gets in a little trouble. He has an ego issue, okay? He gets in a little trouble, and that causes him to wind up in this place called Radiator Springs, where he meets this tow truck named Mater. Mater is a rust bucket. He's a little quirky, if you want to call it that. And he's just different. But in his time there, in Lightning McQueen's time at Radiator Springs, he begins to develop a friendship with Mater. And this friendship pays off because Mater actually helps Lightning McQueen win the Piston Cup. And then in Cars 2, we see this, it's getting kind of weird, bizarre, where Mater becomes a spy, international spy. But before that takes place, we have in Cars 2, this very first beginning of the movie, to show you the type of friendship that they two, these two characters have. So right now, we're going to watch this clip from Cars 2. Check it out. someone else win it just didn't feel right, you know? Well, Doc would have been real proud of it. That's for sure. All right, pal. I've been waiting all summer for this. What do you got planned? Oh, you sure you can handle it? Come on, you know who you're talking to? This is Lightning McQueen. I can handle anything. Uh, Mater? Just remember, your brakes ain't gonna work on me. Mater? Ah, relax. These train tracks ain't been used in years. All right. So right there you saw in that clip how these two characters, Lightning McQueen and Mater, are very different in, in their, their you know, personalities, what they do, their professions, yet they put all that aside to become friends. Why? Because they accepted one another. 
Now, in the gospel here, in the, in the book of Matthew, we see Jesus doing that same exact thing. Jesus' friends are called the disciples. Now, the disciples are a group of misfits. They're a bunch of losers, or in their day, they're a bunch of outcasts. And yet, Jesus didn't care any about that, anything about that stuff. He accepted them for who they are and what they did. In Matthew chapter 9, verse, uh, reading in verse 9, we hear the story of Matthew, one of Jesus' friends, getting to be his friend. Let me read it for you guys. As Jesus went on, on from there, he saw a man named Matthew who was sitting at the tax collector booth. Now, tax collectors are hated individuals. Why? Because they're thieves, they're liars, they're crooks, okay? They're just not nice people. And yet Jesus approached this guy named Matthew. He said, follow me. So Matthew got up immediately and followed him. Later, Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house. Many tax collectors and sinners came. They ate with Jesus and his disciples. Well, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, the people who said what you had to look like or what you had to do, these people who were perfectionist, they asked this question. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Well, Jesus overheard them and said this, those who are healthy don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Go and learn what this means. I want mercy, not sacrifice. I have not come to get those who think they are right with God to follow me. I've come to get sinners to follow me. Jesus came to be friends with sinners, people who are different, people who are misfits. Jesus doesn't care any about any of that other stuff. He just cares about us, which is amazing because guys, I have a little secret for you. We are all sinners. We are all misfits. We are all losers. So that should make you feel a little better today, right? The Pharisees of the day didn't get it, but Jesus did. We need to befriend those who are different than us. Why? Because friends accept one another. That's our point for this virtue of friendship. Friends accept one another. Friends don't judge one another. Friends accept one another. Friends don't belittle each other. Friends accept one another. And being friends like this can be a little awkward and uncomfortable. Because it means going out of your way to befriend someone who might rub you the wrong, wrong way or someone you might not like. It means getting on the phone and befriending someone who hurt you in the past and choosing to forgive them. This type of friendship is messy. Why? Because people are messy. But it's worth it because that's the type of friendship Jesus demonstrated. So if we want to live out this virtue of friendship in our lives, we need to be like Jesus. We need to be like Mater and we need to be like Lightning McQueen. We need to accept one another. Now, when I do points with the kids, main points, bottom lines, I have them repeat it after me on the count of three. Since I don't know any different, you guys have to do the same. So we're gonna have that on the screen and you're gonna repeat it after me on the count of three. One, two, three. Friends accept one another. Awesome job. All right, the next virtue we're gonna look at, it's about trust. Now, this is what trust means. Putting your confidence in someone you could depend on. Now, we show trust in numerous ways every day. You sat down this morning in that chair because you trusted that chair is going to hold you up, and thankfully it did, right? You trust that. You got in your car today to drive here to church. You trusted that the roads were going to take you right to where you need to be instead of the Gulf of Mexico, right? And well, you might want to be at the beach today. I don't know, but, but then you trust your, your spouse to pick up your kids after school, right? You do, well, you have that hope, at least hope you trust they do, but we trust things and people every single day. And here's the amazing part about this. People are going to disappoint you when it comes to trust, but here's the thing about it. We have an amazing big God that we could trust no matter what. Why? Because he loves us and his love is big and awesome and loud especially in the times we have fears. When it comes to fears, fears usually keep our focus off where it needs to be and it causes us to have problems. Now, there's a Disney movie that has this type of trust in it. This guy has a fear issue. In fact, this movie is about the main character going on an epic journey across miles and miles of oceans. The movie I'm talking about is Disney Pixar's Finding Nemo. It's about a father learning to trust his son, Nemo, his friend, Dory, and even himself, Marlon, in the face of fear. So let's watch this clip right now.
All right. Now, Merlin here, uh, Merlin here, he had to trust Dory that everything was going to be okay, and it wound up being okay. But his, he had this big fear issue, which stems all the way back to the beginning of the movie when him and his wife first had uh, fishy kids. Okay, if you remember, there's Barracuda or Shark or something like that, came out and ate up the whole family or something. Okay, we didn't actually see, but left him with just one kid, and that was an email. So because of that one situation in his life, he, he developed this fear. And that's like all of us too. Okay, one situation can cripple us and we could develop fear because of it. Okay, but he had to get over his fear issue, which he did because he leaned on Dory. Dory went with him his whole entire journey. So he had to depend on her. So he learned to trust in Dory, which paid off. That's why he was able to let go and fall and drop in the water. There's a story in the gospel just like that. It deals with Peter, one of Jesus' friends. In Matthew chapter 14, Verse 25 to 33, we have this story. Early in the morning, Jesus went out to the disciples. He walked on the lake. So they saw him walking on the lake and they were terrified. It's a ghost, they cried out in fear. Right away, Jesus called out to them, be brave, it is I, don't be afraid. Peter said, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat. He walked on the water towards Jesus. But when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid. He began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. And right away, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And he said, your faith is so small. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then, then those in the boat worshiped Jesus. And they said, you are, are really the son of God. Now it's impossible, for us, it's impossible for us to really imagine what Peter was feeling, how scared he was. But try, just seriously, try to think about it. Everything in your, in your body is telling you, if you take a step on this water, you're going to drown and you're going to sink and you're going to die. But Jesus is right in front of you telling you to come. So I guess I should. But then just like Peter, the moment something comes up that's scary, a situation in your life comes up, you lose sight of Jesus and you start sinking in the water. Oh no, I, I got this really big project at work or at school I got to finish. Oh man, I'm slowly freaking out. Oh, I'm starting to sink. Oh man, someone got really, really sick. I don't know what to do. This is like really bad. They might die. Oh, I'm starting to sink. Oh man, I had this really big decision. I don't know if I can make it. I'm so worried about the outcome. And, and I'm, I've been there, guys. I worry about things, outcomes like this all the time, big decisions. You don't know how it's going to affect you or your family. Oh, I'm starting to sink. I have this fear issue. But here's the thing. We need to be like Peter. Remember, Peter cried out when he started to sink. He cried out to God and God saved him. You need to say this in those times. You need to say, Jesus, I know you're here. Please help me to know what to do in this situation. I am scared about how it will turn out and I need your help. I know you're here with me and I know you're in control. And here's the awesome thing about God. When you cry out for mercy and help like that, he is there to pick you up to put your, uh, your focus back on him. Most times when we have fear, it's because we're not focused staring at God. And here's the thing we gotta remember about this virtue of trust. We could trust God because he's bigger than our fears. God is bigger than everything. He's a big giant God and God is bigger than our fears. He loves us. He wants us to trust in him. We could depend on that type of God. He's bigger than our fears. He's bigger than my fear of snakes. I got bit by a snake once, you know, and I'm freaking out ever since. You know, I went to the zoo on Monday with my kid and she wanted to stare at the snakes. I'm like, no, let's go, let's go, let's go. But you know what? God is bigger than my fear of snakes. God is bigger than you starting a new job. You're afraid of that. Are you starting a new school next year? He's bigger than that. God is bigger than any of your fears. And we need to trust him because of that. So our... Main point when it comes to trust is this. I could depend on God because he's bigger than my fears. So let's say this on the count of three. I don't want to. Yes, you are. With me. Here we go. One, two, three. I could depend on God because he's bigger than my fears. He is, and I hope you could believe that. All right, last virtue today. Now, this virtue is in tons of Disney movies. You just gotta look at it. There are tons of Disney movies. The virtue I'm talking about is that of sacrifice. This is what sacrifice is. Giving up something valued for something more important. Now, we place value on tons of things. Objects, people, we do this. In our heads, we do. Then what we do is we take those objects and we place them on a scale of what's important to us. 
basically, it's almost like priorities, the same thing. On my scale in my life, this is how I would rank things in my life, okay? Number one, relationship with God. I would not sacrifice anything for that, period, bang, up there. Under that would be my, fam- would be my family. I would not sacrifice anything for my family, right there, okay? There are times, sometimes, it, you know, but there. Under that would be work, okay? Be ministering, you know, there. And then after that would be running, so I love to run. I'm a runner. I do it all the time, okay? Running. That's how my scale. So it, right now, I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to think in your head your scale. It's going to help you out as we go through the sacrifice stuff, okay? Think it out in your head. What's important to you? Think your scale right now. Hopefully, God number one. I'll give you some time. Okay, awesome. All right. So the first type, there's three types of sacrifices. The first type of sacrifice we do is time. We sacrifice our time. Now, time is very interesting because time is the only thing that we could give, but we can't get back. All right? We can't give back any of our time. Once we get, it's out there, it's gone. So it's very interesting. We sacrifice our time. An example is this. It's, you get it, your boss from work. Says, hey, you need this project. You need to be done by the end of the day. So it's five o'clock. It's the end of the day. Project's not done. So what do you do? You make that call. Yeah, honey, I, uh, I didn't get that, that thing done at work I needed to get done. So I'm going to be a little late. Next thing you know, you're home at eight o'clock at night. So what'd you just do? You sacrificed your time with your family, with your time at work. Now, I understand there's hard deadlines. You might get fired, whatever. But, and I'm, I'm not saying that's good or bad, okay? That type of sacrifice. Just an example. But I will say this one thing when it comes to you sacrificing time with your family. A child is only a child a short time before they grow up. I say it like this. A five-year-old is only a five-year-old once, then they are a six-year-old. Don't miss out. Don't miss out. Because you're going to miss something awesome. You really are. Okay, so time. All right, number one. Number two type of sacrifice is wealth. Well, what is wealth? Wealth is basically the amount of valuable resources we have uh, or material possessions. Uh, an example of that is, you know, money, vehicles, cars, or whatever. Now, here's the problem when we sacrifice for wealth. What happens is we don't sacrifice for, you know, give away our money, okay? What happens is we sacrifice other areas of our lives for that wealth. Mainly what usually happens is we sacrifice a relationship with God for because once we try to get this thing that we've been wanting, it actually becomes an idol, a false idol in our life. We worship this thing because we wanted to get it. And God is very specific in this Bible here that talks about how we shouldn't worship those type of things. And here's the problem with this. The reason why you're so focused and sacrificing a lot of stuff to get this, this wealth or material possessions is because that's where you think your life has value in these things. But our real value comes from God, not these material possessions, which also leads into another thing called debt, right? Credit card debt, which is never a good thing because God wants us to live debt-free and live our best, but you know. So sacrifice wealth, time, wealth. Now, the third sacrifice that I want to look at when it comes to sacrifice is this one. It's self. Self Self-sacrifice is this, the act of giving up ourselves for something we view more important than ourselves. Basically, it means putting others ahead of ourselves, putting each other first. Don't being selfish. Parents out there, I'm a parent. I have a two and a half year old and a two month old. They're both girls. So after the service, I'm starting a wedding fund in the back. I'm joking. I'm not. Yes, I am. Okay. Now, as a parent, we do this type of self-sacrifice all the time. And if you are, kids are older now, you could just remember, you could relate, okay? We sacrifice our time, our energy, our resources. Everything we have goes to these kids. Why is that? Well, because we place value on them. They are more important to, than us, all right? They are. Now, not just parents these days are doing this sacrificing when it comes to their self for their families. And in fact, a whole entire family is doing this now. Grandparents are sacrificing themselves for their grandkids these days. Aunts and uncles are doing it as well. Lots of people are doing this. That's where it leads me to my last Disney film. Now, the virtue of sacrifice is very clear in this film. Now, it's very, this film is very popular right now. I was actually playing in the lobby if you saw it. Now, I'm going to show this clip, and I apologize if you've never seen this movie, because I'm going to ruin it for you. It deals with two sisters, a reindeer, this other dude, and uh, a snowman. 
And if you have any kids in your house or even teenagers, and if they're singing any of these songs, you can understand. The movie I'm talking about is Disney's Frozen. So check out this clip. Now, if you, uh, hopefully you've seen that movie. If you haven't seen that movie, it only just came out in November of last year. But anyway, uh, that movie was, is, is about uh, two sisters. Elsa is the oldest. She has like magic ice powers, okay? And, and Elsa shot her sister Anna in the heart with those powers, which just froze her heart. And she, the only way to get it unfrozen is to an act of true love. In any Disney fashion, we always assume that it's a true love kiss, right? It makes sense. It's Disney. But what found out is her lover there, Kristoff, was going to run and give him a kiss. But she saw her sister Elsa there about to be killed, be killed there. And so what she did was she ran over and sacrificed her life to save her sister. And what ends up happening is, is that um, Anna, in the process, sacrificing her life, saves Elsa, saves Arendelle, the city, and saves her own self because her act right there of sacrifice is an act of true love because any type of self-sacrifice is actually an act of love. You wouldn't sacrifice yourself to anybody if it wasn't an act of love. Now, when it comes to the gospel with this type of sacrifice, this virtue, it is pretty much run throughout the whole entire four books. So this this self-sacrifice. Jesus, God's son, sacrificed not only his life, okay? We all know that. Jesus sacrificed his life on the cross. But people don't tend to think about this. He also sacrificed his spot in heaven to come down to earth for 33 years. Heaven is a perfect place. No pain, no sin. It, it was, it's an awesome place. And yet Jesus gave all this up. Now imagine this, okay? This is my Bible according to myself, okay? Imagine this. Here's a conversation one day between God and his son, Jesus, because Jesus is sitting on his right-hand side. I'll be, I'll be God and Jesus. Here's God. Hey, son. It's Because God has a deep voice. Okay. It's time for you to go to earth. It's time to do my will. Go down there. And here's Jesus. I'll be Jesus. Dad, because Jesus has like a little kid voice at this time. Dad, do I really have to? It's, it's not nice down there. there. It's yucky. Do I have to? Yes. And so he went. And Jesus recognized this because, like any good, good son, he does it. But no, he recognizes this because in John chapter 6, verse 38, we read this. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Well, what's God's will? 
God's will is to have Jesus sacrifice his life for us. See, Jesus lived without sin in this world, which is so, so hard to do, but he lived without our sin in this world. Why? To take on the punishment for our sin. God loves us, So he gave us his son, Jesus, to die in our place for our sins. And when we believe this, our soul, after we die, will spend eternity with him if we believe that. See, Jesus gave us the ultimate example of self-sacrifice, giving up himself. He valued God and his plan over himself. Remember he was praying in the garden before he got, you know, got arrested. He was like, God, I really don't want to do this, but if you want me to, I'm going to do it anyways. He valued God over himself. Then his act of sacrifice alone valued us over himself. We're complete strangers to, to him, to Jesus. He doesn't personally know us, you know, like we know other people, but he didn't care. He still sacrificed himself for us so we could be with his dad forever in heaven. I bet if Jesus had a scale in his life, just like mine was, okay, it would be this. God first, then us, then himself. Now, I remember there's no, there's no wealth for Jesus because remember that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, the guys were gambling away his only possessions he had on this earth. God, us, then himself, which leads us to this point about sacrifice, I could sacrifice myself for others because Jesus sacrificed himself for us. Since Jesus sacrificed his life for us, the least we could do is sacrifice for other people. Now, there might be times, okay, Jesus sacrificed his, his self, his actual life for us. You know, there might be times where you might have to do that. I hope not. Like, like the Secret Service guys, right? They would sacrifice them lives, their selves to take a bullet for the president. They would do that. As a parent, you know, I would sacrifice my life if I had to for my kid. If my kid was running in the street, which she possibly could because she doesn't listen well, you know, I would run and push out of the way and I would get hit by a bus because I love her that much. I value her over myself. Because again, remember, sacrifice is an act of love. But sometimes, most times, we're not gonna have to do that, you know, give up ourselves like that. Most times it's just gonna be little things by putting other people's first, putting the needs of others ahead of our own. Now, if you have a marriage out there right now that's struggling, that's tough, that's hard, the best way to have a great, successful, wonderful, loving marriage, the best way to get that back on track is this type of sacrifice, putting the needs of your spouse before your own. Most of the time when it comes to discord and relationships is because they're selfish and they're only thinking about it themselves. But putting your needs aside for your other makes a world of difference. So this afternoon, when you go home, make your spouse a sandwich, okay? That's, one, that's an easy step. You could do that, okay? But it's more to it than that. But again, put the needs of others ahead of your own. That's the least you could do, guys, because Jesus died for us. All right, virtues. They're pretty amazing. Let's say this bottom line. Let's say this one point with me on the count of three. Here we go about sacrifice. Here we go. One, two, three. I can sacrifice for others because Jesus sacrificed himself for me. Great job. Now, virtue is a word that we can live out in our everyday lives. Now, these three virtues are not the only ones out there. There's tons of them. I challenge you to go home today or the next day, whatever, sometime this week, go home and put in a Disney movie. You know, brush off the old VHS of The Little Mermaid. What do you ever do? Put it in there and watch the whole thing. With kids, without kids. It's not creepy if you don't have any kids and you watch Disney movies, okay? It's not bad. Watch it and see if you can find the virtue within them. Everyone has it. Just, I'll give you a hint. Little Mermaid has the sacrifice in it. It does. Just watch it. It does. But there's other ones in it besides, besides that one. And here's the thing. I might get in trouble for saying this, but I don't care. This, we could all agree in here. Hopefully we can. This Bible right here that I have, just like your Bibles at home, is the authority for our life. It's authority for our life. It's how we should live our lives here on this earth, okay? It's, it's the book that we need. However, I believe this is true too. The Bible is not the only source that we could use to help us live our lives, okay? This is the authority in our life, but it's not the only need, thing we need to help us live our lives. Disney movies, watching them, looking at the virtues within them could help us live our lives better. I'm serious. Any other type of movie, okay? 
Anything you watch on TV could be like that. There's some, you know, questionable stuff out there, but the good stuff can. Anything you read. Man, my wife, she's been reading these like parenting articles and books and it's, it's helped her out a little bit, you know? But that's again, another example of things that we could read that could help us out in our lives. And this is why you might, this, this could be controversial, but this is why, this is why I believe it. Because God created everything, he did. So his imprint is in everything, okay? God created everything. He created people in their minds to produce some amazing work. And because of that, his imprint is in it. So just because it's secular, don't shut it out, all right? There's something you probably could learn in it. For today though, when it comes to these three virtues, these are the three things I want you to remember as you leave here today. Friends accept one another. We are all different. We all have these little quirks and personality things. We have different jobs, we have different walks of lives, but it doesn't matter because friends accept one another. Jesus showed us this example. And so we need to be friends to those who are different than us. Friends accept one another. Also, you could depend on God because he's bigger than your fears. God is bigger than anything we could ever uh, have imagined. We should give him our worries, give him our concerns. He's there. He wants us to, and we're in need. Cry out to him because he'll help us out. And also, you could sacrifice your life. You could sacrifice yourself for others because Jesus sacrificed himself for you. If you just put people first, and that's an act of love. And it'll make a big difference in this world and in your relationships with other people. I know it will because I've seen it firsthand. Let us pray and let us ask God and thank God for what he's done for us. And let us pray and just ask God for us to help in these three virtues as we live them out every single day. Father, we just love you so much. And I thank you for what you do for us and what you do through us. God, as I think about these virtues in our lives, I pray that we could live out these three virtues. I pray that we could befriend those who are different than us. I pray that we could friend those who need friends. God, I also pray that we could depend on you through thick and thin, God. We could trust you with our big issues and our small issues. No matter what it is, if we have fear, just give it out to you. Just cry out to you for help. Just like Peter, you'll save us for that. I pray that we could really do that. I also pray, God, that we could sacrifice for others, put others' needs above our own. Don't be selfish, but love on each other. God, I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you for what you did, sending him to earth, giving up that spot in heaven, perfection to come to this broken world. But through that, you restored this world. And I thank you for that. You restored us. I thank you, God. And God, as we leave this, this place today, I challenge everyone in here to live a life pleasing to you. God, I love you. Thank you so much for the opportunity that I got to speak to these people today. And I pray safety upon us all as we come back here next week. God, we love you. It's in your name I pray these things, amen. All right, hey, it's offering time now. So uh, if you'd want to get ready for that, you don't have to. Remember for offering, um, we have online giving as well if you wanna do that. And also uh, out in the, we have a kiosk out there uh, for you to do that. But I got some announcements, of course I do. And so I'll share those guys with you today.